Welcome back to part four and our final part, overviewing the British home front during World War I. We were talking about how there's a big change, a big shift in the British government in December 1916 as we see a new Prime Minister, Lloyd George, takes control. And he's basically taking control with the intention, the, the need for him to organise things more tightly and to have better control over the government, over industry, and in particular uh, because of problems around food shortages because of the effective U-boat blockade. We've already looked at the role of the National Service Women's Land Army and the role that women were playing replacing the agricultural labour that had gone off to the battlefields. The other thing is a massive um, campaign from the new Ministry of Food to help to reduce waste, to reduce the amount of resources that are being used by the civilian population. You can see here this poster, the kitchen is the key to victory, eat less bread. It's not telling people to starve, but it is telling people, cut back. Can you cut it back just a little bit? Make sure we don't waste any, and then we'll make sure we have enough to go around. Some of the other initiatives that are introduced in 1916 and 1917 include encouraging people to build their own vegetable gardens um, and keep chickens in their backyards. In other words, be more self-sufficient so we're not reliant on these imports coming in. Uh, also, in 1917, they look to introduce a meatless day each week, at least one meatless day each week. And this punch cartoon, um, we see our old friend here, Mariana, from uh, representing France. She's going to help the British uh, woman actually move to a meatless day. Um, so she says here, so you're going to start a meatless day, my dear. Would you like me to show you how to cook a cabbage? remember Mariana being from a peasant background. It's interesting here we've got our very uh, helmet-like Britannia uh, style um, uh, hat on our uh, home British housewife. We also see um, the introduction of rationing but rationing really only comes in 1918 as the harvest gets worse. So rationing only comes to Britain right at the end of the war. Until that time, they are able to manage their resources quite effectively, although there is a scare in 1916 um, about the wheat supplies. So from 1918, we're seeing rationing of meat, sugar, butter and eggs, and the use of ration books, which really... Um, it does contain the amount of foodstuffs, food resources that people can get their hands on, but it doesn't necessarily limit them to very small, ridiculous amounts. In fact, there are some working class people who the ration books actually gave them a ration above the standard amount of foodstuffs that they would normally have access to and actually improved their diets as the war progressed towards the end. So rationing helps to maintain supply and stops starvation across Britain. As we will see, this is quite different to the story that is happening on the German home front, where conditions are quite much, much worse for the civilian population. There is, There are fines introduced for wastage of food, and this is just an example of some of the convictions that are being imposed in 1918. Um, so, you know, certain people fined £20, three months imprisonment for it unlawfully obtaining and using ration books. So the government was serious about enforcing these new rationing and food, food supply and maintenance restrictions. Despite these efforts and despite, you know, good control from the government on this side, we do see war weariness set in. One of the interesting things to note is that while we have war weariness occurring on the home front, we're seeing shortages of food. We're seeing quite a change in people's lifestyle. As I said, 
No, the, the domestic servants are not there to support and look after the upper classes anymore. They've had to cut back on certain things in their lifestyle. And we start to see a bit of a mood of fear and concern creep into the civilian population in Britain. Many of the soldiers who are actually returning from the battlefront, we can see diaries that they've written where they're actually telling us about the change that they have seen back home from when they originally left in 1914, 1915. They've arrived back home to a very changed circumstance. And many of them actually lamented, that is, were sad about leaving behind the camaraderie of the trenches. You know, this kind of activity we can see in this photo here, a bit, bit of larrikinism, a, a, a sense of friendship and closeness, closeness of bonds between the men fighting together on the front line. And then when they went home, more of a feeling of despair had set in on the home front. The important thing to understand, however, is that Britain, both the soldiers and the civilian population, never completely give in to despair. But by the time the armistice is signed in November 1918, there is a massive outpouring of joy and relief. As it seems the war has ended, and for Britain, it has ended in victory. Elections were held in Britain in the end of 1918. As soon as the armistice was signed, the elections were called. Remember that elections had been put on hold in Britain during the war, and the coalition government had been established, initially under Asquith, and then from December 1916 under the Prime Minister Lloyd George. Elections were held, and Lloyd George was seen to have done such a fantastic job leading Britain with the coalition government that Lloyd George was returned as the Prime Minister um, and remained the Prime Minister until 1922. Um, he was certainly well supported by the British population. Lloyd George went on to have a key role in the Paris Peace Conference and the signing, the creation and signing of the Treaty of Versailles. One of the interesting things about the elections at the end of 1918 is that we have a wider number of British people voting than ever, ever before. Many men who had not held certain amounts of property had been excluded from voting before 1918, which means that quite a number of the poor working class soldiers who'd been sent off to war, either volunteered or conscripted, had not had the chance to vote before 1918. The other major change to the electorate, of course, is women. In Britain, women did not have the vote at all until 1918. From 1918, women aged 30 and over were now eligible to vote. And we can see here a very famous suffragette, Christabel uh, Pankhurst, putting in her vote in 1918. So the political processes had been put on hold in Britain during the war, but we actually see them expanded as a result of the war. And this concludes off looking at our overview of the British home front from the outbreak of war through to its conclusion in 1918, and reflecting again on the social, economic and political impacts on the civilians and how these ch um, changed over time as the war progressed.